Conspiracy theorizing is basically a national pastime this week, and I don't even say that dismissively. It's actually totally understandable. One of the nation's highest profile prisoners supposedly kills himself amid a series of breakdowns in prison protocol. There is a long list of rich and powerful people who would be very glad to see him dead, and we still don't have an official explanation for exactly what happened. Investigations are still pending, and so in that context, your guess is basically as good as mine, and there's a lot of fun to be had in connecting the dots we do have in creative ways. Clinton body count, Trump body count, Putin body count is a deeper cut. We'll have to get Mueller on that case. But my favorite deep cut of all is my pillow guy body count. He, of course, has Trump's back and manufactures quality pillowcases with the tensile strength necessary for an efficient political assassination. Some of these are serious, some of them aren't. We're all trying to outdo each other and have a little fun playing real life clues and for better or worse, that game includes the President of the United States, who retweeted Terrence Williams saying he is unsurprised that the Clinton body count has added another tally mark. All the liberals were calling me a conspiracy theorist, saying, Terrence, you coming up with crazy conspiracies and you need to be banned from Twitter. He had information on the Clintons and the man ended up dead. Now, for some odd reason, people that have information on the Clintons end up dead. And so, of course, media outlets bumped this to story number one. The New York Times called out Trump for sharing a fringe, unfounded theory Theory, as did the Washington Post, and TV News said much the same. President Trump using his massive Twitter platforms to spread a deranged conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theories, one retweeted by Epstein's former friend, President Trump. There is no evidence at all to support the conspiracy theory the president is fueling. President Trump, who had personal ties to Epstein, retweeted an unfounded theory that former President Bill Clinton was connected to Epstein's death. And I'm not actually mad about that. That is their job, demanding evidence for claims, holding holding the powerful to account, separating fact from speculation. I don't know to what degree the president was serious and to what degree he was just joining in on that trolley national pastime this week, but strictly speaking, yes, unfounded accusations of murder from our political leaders are something I would like the media to investigate and fact find on. But that goes for anyone in political power, those I agree with and those I don't, those who currently sit in the Oval Office and those who aspire to sit there soon. The trouble is, lost in the weekend's news of Epstein's death were other murder conspiracy theories from politicians of similar power, conspiracy theories that are actually far more at odds with the demonstrated facts, not just spitballed ideas in a factual vacuum. Friday was the fifth anniversary of the death of Michael Brown, the infamous police shooting that gave rise to the most fraudulent Black Lives Matter narrative of them all, hands up, don't shoot. The facts came out over the next few months. A grand jury's review of the evidence resulted in no indictment for Officer Darren Wilson. A decision by a demographically representative grand jury, by the way, a supposed injustice for which local infrastructure and businesses had to pay, looted and vandalized to the degree of millions of dollars in damage. I ain't peaceful. I ain't no protest. I'm violent. Burn that motherfucker down. The justice system functioned as designed. The evidence showed that Michael Brown was the aggressor against Officer Wilson, who was justified in his use of lethal force. And even if you don't believe that evidence or the grand jury, Obama's Justice Department under Eric Holder concluded the same thing after a several months long civil rights investigation of its own. That report reads, quote, there is no credible evidence that Wilson willfully shot Brown as he was attempting to surrender or was otherwise not posing a threat. For the reasons set forth above, this matter lacks prosecutive merit and should be closed. All of that is the context for senators and presidential candidates Elizabeth Warren and Kamala Harris tweeting on Friday that Michael Brown was murdered and the fight for justice carries on. Now maybe you say, oh, come on, let's not be technical. Michael Brown was killed, it was sad, and that's what they mean whether the technical murder definition applies or not. Okay, fine, but it's not just that the term murder means unjustified killing. It's that the rest of their tweets say explicitly that this incident was unjustified. We'll fight for justice because this is an example of systemic racism. We'll fight for stronger accountability because somehow there was none here. We'll emphasize race 
even though there is no finding of racial bias in this case. These claims aren't just unfounded, they're actually at odds with the facts as concluded through due process by both a local jury and the Federal Justice Department. Well, that sounds like exactly the sort of conspiratorial Twitter nonsense from the politically powerful that our trusty media are eager to investigate and clarify. I'm sure they're on the case. Bueller? 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 Bueller. The Washington Post was a member of this cricket chorus until early Tuesday morning when, to their credit, they finally gave Harris and Warren their well-earned four Pinocchios. But until that publication, none of the major outlets so eager to police Epstein claims cared to write even a sentence about this one. It is such glaring journalistic negligence on such brazen political lies, it is so bad that even Vox tapped out and said, uh, guys, I know we all love War Chief Warren and the Jamaican reparations lady, but let's be honest, this is bullshit. Yes, Vox took a break from trying to bully its critics and competition off the internet. They took a break from explainers on why lispy queer is both a slur and a proud identity at the same time, and they actually published a useful breakdown of the facts of the matter in this case. Michael Brown had just violently robbed a nearby convenience store. He was stopped by Officer Wilson, and Brown reached into Wilson's car, punched Wilson and tried to grab his gun. The gun discharged. Brown initially ran away before turning and charging Wilson. Brown was then shot fatally with no shot hitting him from behind. Now, of course, our Vox author doesn't want to let the specific facts of this case twist the overall progressive narrative. He says Warren and Harris damaged their bigger message about racism in policing, a real problem he's written about before, but that's a debate for another day, at least to his credit. He has the integrity to say five years after this matter was settled, presidential campaigns are still getting it flat out wrong. And so it's come to this. I can now trust the hyper-partisan Vox for more credible fact-finding and watchdogging than the country's major newspapers or TV networks. If only we could harness this unholy alliance, combine the obsessive fact-finding of independent YouTube with Vox's bloodlust for its competition, we'd be unstoppable against the real problem here, an establishment media that only cares for facts when it's politically convenient. The last thing I'll say about the importance of holding politicians accountable on these claims is it's not just about the benefit of an informed citizenry. It's also about basic fairness and decency for the accused. It's a matter of due process and the presumption of innocence as cultural values, not just legal technicalities. Unfounded accusations of murder or any horrible crime coming from people in positions of power can ruin lives. And by all accounts, that is exactly what has happened to Officer Darren Wilson. And yes, that same standard benefits the Clintons too. I'm not advocating that anyone throw around murder accusations loosely, but certainly the Clintons are in better position to defend themselves than is Darren Wilson, a man known publicly only for this particular incident. Darren Wilson, from what I can tell, has all but disappeared after his exoneration. He resigned from the Ferguson Police Department to protect the safety of his fellow officers. He sought police jobs elsewhere, but was unsuccessful. He worked a few weeks at a boot store stocking inventory, but he quit when reporters started calling the store. No matter what he does, he says they try to get a story off of it. He was donated a good amount of money at the time after the legal battle was over. He bought a house without his name on the deed, with only a few friends even knowing where he lives. This reporting is now four years years old, and I see nothing on his whereabouts or activity more current than that. The guy's life is ruined, or at least forever altered into a state of forced seclusion, even though he did nothing wrong. That is the importance of finding and reporting the truth, beyond just making sure you and I are well informed as voters. And so it's not just that Warren and Harris and their media protection squad are willing to misinform us. It's that they're willing to perpetuate a life-ruining lie against an innocent man who was cleared through multiple layers of our justice system. Just so they can have a moment of racial pandering and virtue signaling in pursuit of whatever polling bump they can get. Anyone who is so hungry for power that they're willing to abuse an innocent citizen and public servant in this way to get it is someone who ought to be as far away from that power 
as possible. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel always. Appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Twitter. That is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye.